We just heard news that Treasury Secretary Mnuchin has decided not to extend several of these federal emergency lending programs to businesses. The fact that they don't have access to this money anymore is not good news for the markets. We also have news that the coronavirus continues to surge throughout the United States. The average cases now are above 150,000 a day. This is an incredible amount of spread in the United States. The coronavirus is spreading like wildfire. And as a result, local officials are starting to do those dreaded shutdowns again. We are in the midst of a second surge. So tonight, I've signed Executive Order 94, advising Wisconsinites to stay home to save lives. We need to begin to practice the social distancing, shut things down a little earlier. We begin all of that stuff today. That's right, we're back in shutdown mode. Now you might be thinking, this is clearly what he's saying is the issue at the stock market. But you'd be wrong. This is not the issue with the stock market. The issue with the stock market is despite the news of no fiscal stimulus, despite the news of rising coronavirus cases, and despite the news of things being locked down again, everything is too expensive. The stock market continues to soar despite all this bad news. If you look at the S&P 500, for instance, it's up 10% for the year. That is a really good performance given that we're in a year that we have a global pandemic, we have mass unemployment, and we have many businesses that probably won't make it into 2021. We also have the NASDAQ. This is the tech-heavy companies that have actually, in many cases, benefited from the coronavirus. They're up 30.9%. That is an amazing performance in one year. These companies are richly valued. Many of these tech companies are trading at record high multiples. And then we have the Dow Jones the companies that have been really hurt by the coronavirus. Many of these have taken a while to recover, but even the Dow Jones is in the green by 2% year to date. So in this episode, we're gonna take a step back, look at the situation, and see if we can find any value with these companies currently. I'll be going over my portfolio and revealing which companies I'm gonna be buying this week. There's one in finance and one in healthcare. Now, before jumping into all of that, be sure to like the video as well as subscribe to the channel with the little bell thing. Apparently that helps out the channel and the algorithm to help spread this video to other people. Okay, so let's jump right in. First of all, we have Bill de Blasio shutting back down a major part of New York City. It's an area of tremendous concern. Uh, the new reported cases on a seven day average, the threshold 550, unfortunately we far surpassed that in many of these states, despite their previous rounds of lockdowns, the trends of new cases continues to move upwards. They're seeing that in New York, as well as in places like California and Chicago. Estimates are that we could see a thousand more Chicagoans die from this virus by the end of the year. And now we're even starting to see the coronavirus spread in new states where it really hasn't spread much, like Utah. We're at the uh, breaking point and ready to have some serious repercussions because of that, that challenge. Governor Herbert of Utah says that things are at a breaking point. Just on Thursday, the U.S. reported 187,000 new cases. That's 10,000 more than the prior record that we set. So we're now up to 187,000. We could be crossing 200,000 cases a day soon. As a result, public health officials' warnings have taken more of an urgent tone in recent weeks, shifting from officials discouraging travel and large gatherings to outright pleading with the public to stay put and stay away from others. They now believe that they've narrowed down what is actually spreading the virus. It's not really people going out to grocery stores and not wearing masks. It's little family gatherings, little get-togethers with friends. They say, quote, the data's become very clear that a major cause of recent surges in cases is small gatherings, particularly indoor environments where people are eating, drinking, and talking loudly with their face coverings off. So something that looks a lot like a family meal. This is what they're trying to now discourage people from doing. Getting together with family on Thanksgiving or friends. That's going to be a tough sale. I don't know how many people are going to follow that. They say it's a tough message. And it's tough because people think that you're infringing on their family or their rights. But really, we're trying to protect their families or their coworkers or others from the spread. So I agree that I think this is a tough message. I don't know how many people are going to forego meeting with family and friends over the holiday. Some people might, but a lot probably won't. And I can assume that the cases are going to continue to rise over the coming months. And while this is going on, while the virus continues to spread, we also have the news that Treasury Secretary Mnuchin has decided to not extend several of the Federal Reserve lending facilities. These are facilities that the Treasury and the Federal Reserve set up to act as a backstop for the markets. If the markets become dysfunctional. If they're not able to work, if there's not the level of liquidity needed for people to get their money out of the markets, the Fed would come in and inject liquidity into the markets. So it's a little bit of a confidence boost. The Fed really hasn't had to use these that much just by allowing them to exist. 
Just by allowing them to be there, investors know that they have liquidity and therefore investors are more likely to stay invested. Well, a lot of those programs are coming to an end and Treasury Secretary Mnuchin has faced a lot of criticism and a lot of flack for this. Even online, you can see people accusing him of partisan politics. Here's one user saying, this is a terrible idea from the optic standpoint. I get the intent to screw over the incoming administration. Unfortunately, this will negatively impact the American people much, much more, especially since cases are climbing and businesses are going to continue to struggle. I'm honestly speechless at the self-serving act of this exiting administration. So this Redditor thinks that it's done because of politics. Now, Mnuchin has responded to a lot of claims like this, that this is done out of politics, to explain his actions behind this. And uh, I'm glad to be on to explain this because I think it's really pretty straightforward and people are missing the issue. These were all done with money that the Treasury has in the Exchange Stabilization Fund. Uh, Congress entrusted Treasury with $500 billion. It was really unprecedented. And that money could be used to work with the Federal Reserve and with direct loans to airlines and national security companies. And we announced a series of other facilities with the Fed. We negotiated this specific language. And on the Fed facilities, the $450 billion that Congress gave me, uh, it was very clear that the congressional intent is it expires on December of this year. It's, it's very clear in the law. So he's saying, no, this isn't because of politics. They're not wanting to damage the incoming administration. He's doing this because it was what's written into the law. This is what Congress originally decided. He goes on to explain that he thinks that the Fed has plenty of liquidity to offer, that they can still backstop the market. They don't need this money. And in fact, he thinks this money could be used a lot more effectively in different places. There's $500 billion of money that Congress appropriated that is now expiring uh, we have $130 billion of PPP money sitting around. We, we need Congress to reappropriate these funds. We, we could do $500 billion of fiscal response immediately that won't cost taxpayers any more money. And, and let's spend it on small business PPP loans. He wants to reallocate this money to PPP loans, to give it out to small businesses. And they could do that without actually passing a new stimulus or a new bill. And Mnuchin says he is planning to discuss a more targeted financial stimulus. Now that we're past the elections, he thinks that there's a better chance of a stimulus getting passed. And I think he's correct. I think that now that there's less politics at play, there's probably a better chance of them coming to an agreement. So my guess is we'll see a financial stimulus sometime down the road. I think it will be much more targeted. It'll be harder for just every business to get a piece of it. Uh, I think it will really go to businesses that probably need it more. But while that's going on, Pfizer has also announced that they're going to be seeking approval for their vaccine today. They're doing it Friday, which is today. So it's unclear how long the FDA will take to approve it. I think the FDA is going to approve this thing very quickly. It says in this report, given the urgency, the FDA is expected to move quickly. The timing of the filing is in line with industry and government officials' projections for the authorization and distribution to begin next month. Yes, you heard that clearly. Pfizer said the filing could allow for distribution to begin the middle to the end of December. That's this December. A lot of people are still way off with their timelines of when they think the vaccine is going to be available. They're thinking sometime in the middle of 2021, maybe by the end of 2021, it's going to be next month. That's when they're going to start distributing it. Now, of course, the first people to receive it are likely going to be ER doctors and people in the medical field that are the most vulnerable, people right on the front lines seeing these patients every day. They're going to be the first ones to get it. But after that, they're going to start distributing it and it'll be widely available for people to get. I think that we could see wide scale distribution of the vaccine very early next year. If they get approved on schedule, we could see that happen. So the question is, what do we do with our investments right now? What do we do with our portfolios? We have a Fed that's very accommodating to the market. We have coronavirus cases that are rising every single day. States are starting to shut back down left and right. And then we also have the news of a vaccine being seemingly right around the corner. So there's a lot of news going on right now. But the main issue in the markets, in my opinion, is that value is difficult to find. It's very difficult to find good value right now. You have what I think is two different categories of stocks. You have tech stocks and you have recovery stocks. The tech stocks are the ones that have benefited from the coronavirus. These are the ones like Zoom, Peloton, Apple, Microsoft. These are all the companies that have gone up to sky high valuations because investors have looked for safe places to put their money during this pandemic environment that we live in. Will these valuations come back down 
after we have a vaccine and if we live in a post-coronavirus world. On the other hand, we have recovery stocks. Recovery stocks, for the most part, what I've seen is that the good ones have already recovered. The ones that haven't recovered yet likely are facing more long-term consequences. So this is the dichotomy I see in the market. You have richly valued tech stocks that have benefited from the pandemic, and then you have recovery stocks for the most part that have already recovered. This creates an issue where it's difficult to find value in today's market. So I'll show you a couple companies that I've been buying in my portfolio. Now I'll tell you, it's been a struggle to find value. One of the companies that I bumped up my holdings a little bit in is Home Depot. That's one that, despite the fact it's already had a run-up in price, it continues to pay over a 2% dividend yield, which is pretty good for consumers, and Home Depot has an incredible rate of dividend growth. They're growing their dividend at a rate of 25% year over year. That is a very fast dividend growth. This company has net income of like $11 billion plus every single year, so it's a highly profitable company, and I think that it's a company that will continue to do good even if the coronavirus was suddenly cured. This company does good in all environments. It does good when the housing industry is bad. It does good when the housing industry is good. It does good in pandemics. It does good outside of pandemics. Home Depot is just a very solid company. I think it's completely Amazon proof. It has a huge market share in its industry. It continues to grow and it's highly profitable. So this is one that I've continued to dollar cost average in. Another company that I still like is J.P. Morgan Chase. This is one that Warren Buffett recently sold his entire stake in to favor Bank of America. So Warren Buffett chooses Bank of America. I choose J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, I don't know why Warren Buffett likes Bank of America so much more than J.P. Morgan, but I just don't understand the decision. I think that J.P. Morgan's a better bank, so this is the one that I've been putting my money into. This is partly a value and recovery play. J.P. Morgan should continue to recover if the economy starts to recover over the next year. We'll see how things work out. Maybe a lot of businesses will go out of business and make this one struggle. I think that they can handle a lot of business losses. So this company, in my opinion, is in a good position. It pays over a 3% dividend, and I think that it will continue to give shareholders a lot of reward in the future. And the last one that I've been buying is in healthcare. AbbVie is a company that recently spiked in price. So it went up like 15% after their earnings, but even after that increase in price, this company's still yielding above 5%, which is really high in today's market. And if you look at that 5% yield, you might think that Abvi is unsafe in paying it, that they won't be able to pay that out in the future, but they recently just announced that they're raising their dividend by 10%. So they're still increasing their dividend despite it yielding over 5%. That is a sign from the company that their dividend is to stay. They wouldn't be increasing the dividend by 10% if they're struggling to pay it. So those are the companies I've been buying. I've been adding more JP Morgan, more Avvi, and more Home Depot. These are the ones that I've been able to find some value in right now. I could be buying more REITs, but I already have a lot of REITs in my portfolio. So I don't know how much more I want to add to that. If there is any companies you think present really good value right now, let me know in the comments below and I'll look at them. Now let's go and move on to some business news. First of all, we have Amazon. Amazon, if you don't know, is eventually just going to own planet Earth. It'll just own everything. We'll all be employees of Amazon. We'll all be just cogs in this giant machine that is Amazon. They have moved one step further into this by announcing that they're now a pharmacy. So Amazon and the amount of companies that they actually are is pretty incredible if you think about it. They own Twitch, Audible, they own Amazon Prime, which gives you all these different perks in these different categories. Of course, they own a lot of the online retail. They own an entertainment industry with Amazon Prime Video. They have Amazon Music, and it's subsidized by your Amazon Prime membership. Amazon also owns Whole Foods, and now they're opening up physical locations as well. But this is the latest move for Amazon, Amazon Pharmacy. What if it was this easy to get your medication? Like, never wait in a line, delivered to your door, don't even have to stop what you're doing, easy. Really? Yep. Introducing Amazon Pharmacy. Now you can get your meds delivered just like everything else. We make it easy to understand and compare prices and co-pays, and we work with most insurance plans. So you don't have to worry about it. Once we have your prescription, your meds should arrive in just a few days. We'll send you updates along the way, so you're always kept in the loop. Plus, you can request refills or see your medication history. And if you have any questions, we're always available. Sign up today so the service will be ready whenever you need us. On it. It's that easy to make Amazon your new pharmacy. That's the pitch. Amazon is making your drugs just one click away. 
Now you can see the sheer force of Amazon. Just by announcing this, Walgreens stock took a nosedive. Of course, a huge part of Walgreens is their pharmacy. And so Amazon getting into the pharmacy biz, not good for Walgreens. Walgreens investors can try to rationalize how it's going to be okay, but deep down, they're really concerned about this. Whenever Amazon enters into your industry, you might say, this is okay. We're still going to be able to compete. We can still do this. But deep down, you're a little bit concerned because Amazon's really good at going into different industries and being highly competitive. Walgreens has traded down about 16% on this news. GoodRx, which is another drug delivery company, also took a pretty significant dive after this. It's currently down about 20% since this news. Now, one thing I'll mention regarding Amazon moving into pharmacy is I think that they'll be successful because they understand something that a lot of companies don't seem to understand to the same level as Amazon. There's some companies that have figured this out, but investors should be focusing on it a lot. I've noticed that there's a big push into thematic investing. People invest based off of themes. For instance, a lot of people are investing based off of disruptive innovation. That's a theme. That's a whole style of investing where you try to invest in companies that disrupt the status quo. Another theme that I would look at investing in is convenience. Anything that offers a drastic improvement in convenience is likely something that people are going to gravitate to. Amazon understands this. Do you notice how much they stress convenience? Listen to how many times they say the word easy in this video. What if it was this easy to get your medication? Don't even have to stop what you're doing easy. Really? Yep, we make it easy to understand and compare prices and co-pays. It's that easy to make Amazon your new pharmacy. Easy, easy, easy. They say it like once every 10 seconds because that's really what you're buying when you invest in Amazon. You're buying a company that what they do is they just make things more easy and convenient for consumers. This is a huge theme that I think everything is moving towards. The companies that are going to be the most successful are the ones that offer consumers the most convenience. Now, we also have news that Tesla is going to be added into the S&P 500. This is obviously very big news for a lot of people that have been very bullish on Tesla for a long time. And it was big news for people that really don't like Tesla. And they think it's a huge bubble because they're now saying, well, this big bubble company is going to be in the S&P 500. And a lot of people are going to own it despite not wanting to. They don't really want to have Tesla in the S&P 500. So it's caused a lot of arguments. Now, if we look at the companies that have been removed from the S&P 500 and compare it with Tesla, I think it makes sense. The three stocks removed from the S&P 500 in September are H&R Block, Cody, and Kohl's. These three companies have been struggling for a while. They're finally being removed from the S&P 500 to make way for Tesla. And in my opinion, I think Tesla is a far better company than any of these three. So if you're holding the S&P 500, I would not be upset by these changes. Okay, moving on, let's go ahead and jump into some questions here. The email address is joseph at josephcarlsonshow.com. Feel free to email in any questions you have for the show. The first one's from Darius. He says, hey, Joseph, quick question for you. First, I love your show. Now for my question. I'm in the middle of restructuring my portfolio, and I'm curious what is a, quote, good range to search for when deciding which company to buy with dividends. Right now, I think all the companies should have a minimum of a 3% dividend yield and roughly a maximum of 8%. Of course, I look at other statistics such as PE ratio and overall growth of a company, but my main question is about the dividend range. Thank you for your time. Well, Darius, this is something that a lot of people debate about. What type of yield your portfolio should have? In this case, you're saying you want all your companies, every single one, to have a starting dividend yield of 3 to 8%. I think that's a little bit high. I think overall that will omit a lot of good companies that are under that 3% in the 2% range. Companies like Home Depot that have fantastic earnings, that continue to raise their dividend every year at an aggressive pace, you're not going to be investing in those because you have the criteria of 3 to 8%. So, I wouldn't necessarily do that. I would look for companies that fall underneath that 3% and look at the quality of their earnings, look to see if they're growing their dividend aggressively over time, and I would still consider those companies. Before coronavirus, interest rates were quite a bit higher. It was easier to find yield. My portfolio was around a 4% yielding portfolio, and now it's around 3%. So mine's dropped down a percent starting yield. I'm still focusing on companies that I think are between the range of 2 to 4%. So I find a lot of companies that are in that range, like consumers are usually in the 2 to 3% range. There's a lot of companies that are above that range, like financials, healthcare, and real estate. Those are all usually 3 to 5% dividend yields. And then there's some companies below that range. Tech companies usually have a starting yield below 2%. So 
In my opinion, I think you should introduce companies from all those different categories and look at the average yield rather than the yield of every single company individually. Because if you're just focusing on companies that have a starting yield of 3-8%, to I think you're going to miss out on some really good dividend growth companies. Chantel says, hello, Joseph. I've been watching your show for a while and really enjoy the content. In the last episode, number 125, you said you would be fine putting all of your savings in the S&P 500 and that it is diversified enough. I get that from an American perspective. However, I am from Europe. Would you still recommend the same when the ETF is not in your own currency? I do own the S&P 500 as a portion of my portfolio, but I would not be confident putting it all in the S&P 500, mostly because of the dollar euro fluctuations, and I want to keep part of my portfolio in my own currency. What is your take on this? Would you still be confident in only the S&P 500 if you lived outside of the US, or would your advice change? Well, Chantel, I don't think that I would change too much about my advice, even if I was a European citizen. If I grew up in Europe and I was familiar with their companies, I might have more individual holdings in Europe just because I'm more familiar with them. I use them more and I know what to put my money in. So I do think there is some home court bias. If you grow up in Europe, you're probably more familiar to the companies around you and you can identify better investments. So in that case, I would be putting more money in European companies if I was a resident there. But on a bigger scale, in the general scheme of things, When you're looking where to put your money and where to invest, you're wanting to find where there's going to be the most capitalism, the most innovation, the most entrepreneurship, the most business creation and business growth and exciting ideas that will transform the world. You want to own the companies that money flows to, that people use and they use their services and they use everything that they have to offer. A lot of those companies are in the U.S., A lot of them are these big tech companies that control a huge amount of people's money and cash flow. So I think that currency fluctuations is a secondary concern. What I would look at primarily is where you think there's going to be the most innovation over the course of the next 10 years. And that's probably where most of your money should be. If you think that's going to happen in Europe, I would have most of my money in Europe. If you think it's going to happen in the US, I would put most of my money in the US. And Likewise, if you think it's going to happen in China, you could probably put some exposure in China and buy some of those companies as well. China does have some extra concerns with the way their government runs, but uh, outside of those concerns, there's probably going to be some innovation there as well. So what I would do is I would look over the world, see where you think has both the most stable government and the place that will see the most growth over the next 10 years. That's where I would put most of my money, regardless of where I'm a citizen of. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and end this episode there. I appreciate all of you for tuning in. Be sure to check out the Patreon if you haven't already. There's a link in the description. It's a lot of fun. If you join it, we can talk on the Discord this weekend. Otherwise, I'll see you guys next time.